Okay, everyone. Uh, good afternoon or good evening, depending on where you're calling in from. Thank you very much for uh, joining the CPRN and CP Now update on Research CP. I know a lot of you uh, that are on the call are actually probably pictured here in this picture on my uh, on my screen um, from our workshop in uh, 20 in June 2017. Um, so I'm going to sort of take you through a little bit about the workshop, but I'm hoping everyone on the call has had the time to read the uh, published paper, get reacquainted with it if you read it right when it came out last uh, last summer, uh, and then take you through um, sort of the results of the workshop, like what happened um, coming out of the workshop that led to the paper, and then talk about what we've done since then. Okay. Um, so that's really the agenda that I just covered. And then I'm going to end with opportunities for you to all be able to stay engaged because that was one of the big bits of feedback from the workshop is people wanted to find a way to stay engaged with the research, stay engaged with uh, the clinicians and researchers, uh, and just continue to contribute. Um, okay, so just the, the sort of quick background. Um, CPRM was founded to be patient-centered uh, from the get-go, and so uh, Research CP was really conceived as a way that uh, we could set for part of CPRN our research agenda, and PCORI, uh, who was the main funder, really encouraged us to broaden that and really make something that would inform the whole research community uh, of what uh, people in the community wanted for uh, research. And really a key driver to this was that the, that um, parents and people with CP and other, uh, other caregivers really feel like decision making with the amount of uh, options that there are as our uh, kids or as we grow uh, older with this condition, um, there's just not a lot of comparative research. And PCORI was very focused on comparative research. And, uh, really steered us uh, in making sure that the focus of research CP was on uh, looking at uh, comparators. And then in the end, to communicate those research priorities uh, to the broader research community so that instead of things being um, necessarily investigator initiated uh, because it's an interesting re research idea, but to really make sure that people were starting research that was focused on things that the community wants. Um, so we set out four objectives um, in the PCORI Award. One was to conduct a series of webinars to educate um, people and both uh, patients, uh, um, community members, caregivers, and clinicians. I know June is going to tell me I shouldn't say patients, and I apologize. Uh, then to build on that and to distribute a survey, which we ended up doing dynamically and all uh, with uh, CoDigital, which was this interactive uh, uh, mechanism for um, looking at what questions should be, convene the workshop uh, to really set the comparative effectiveness research agenda, and finally publish a white paper. So those were in the grant uh, that was funded. Um, sort of the steps of the process uh, were that we had 275 people that participated uh, in the webinars, um, and then we invited everyone that participated in the webinars to move on to participate in the survey. Uh, and we had about 201 participants there, uh, and that group generated 392 ideas, about 26,000 votes over 20 days, uh, and those were responding to the questions of what is the most important question in research or what's the most important thing to change in care and treatment. And then the workshop uh, had 83 applicants uh, and 47 attendees and was a day and a half in Chicago in 2017. And that took the top 20 ideas from this co-digital uh, process and called it down a little bit further to 16 research ideas, uh, and also generated a very important list of sort of key takeaways from the meeting, and I'll talk about those in a bit. Um, just to give you a little more um, breakdown of those participants, uh, it was pretty evenly split if you look, if you add parents and caregivers of people with uh, CP, and people with CP um, is really very closely aligned between that and uh, clinicians, therapists, or, uh, or researchers uh, as, a, as an audience. Um, and we tried to maintain that split um, all the way through to the workshop and keep it quite balanced between the sort of 
clinical research voice and the community um, voice. And we actually have details that are, uh, you can find in the paper about whose voice had the, whose voices had the most effect, um, and sort of at the detail level, um, you know, who was represented from the community and who was represented from, uh, the clinical research environment. So I'm just going to just flash you a few pictures if you were not one of the people that were able to attend. We broke out into about four breakout groups that were uh, facilitated by the group leaders. So this is uh, one of the groups working on, on a set of, uh, of the resultant ideas and trying to cull them further. Um, this, uh, that is uh, Diantha there who gave probably in the middle, who gave probably one of the most powerful statements at the end of the meeting. Uh, and then just the groups going around and doing uh, introductions to, with, through dyads where you had to introduce the person sitting next to you just to give you a little feel of the workshop. And the, the group was from uh, all over the U.S. Um, so we really, I think we did a good job of uh, trying to get good geographic representation as well as uh, what the members of the community and the, um, and the clinicians and researchers uh, were focused on. And then in the end, we met the fourth goal of publishing. Um, it was not a white paper, but a published peer-reviewed paper, which is even better, uh, to set the agenda. Um, so we got it down to 16 research ideas, although it's really important to point out that we published online all 392 ideas. And we think that just because an idea was, you know, not in the top 16, it's still very important, and that way, uh, uh, researchers can reference those ideas um, along the way as having been in the agenda. Um, and we talked about these two fundamental shapes of the questions. And the idea of the care and treatment question was that was intended to be something that members of the community would feel more comfortable addressing and not feeling like they had to know what a good research question was. And then the clinical research ideas was aimed at getting the people that were used to conducting research to be thinking of what were their research questions, and then the voting happened. Um, so in the end of the 16 ideas, they broke into kind of three clumps of groups, the comparative effectiveness of interventions, uh, and then understanding the impacts of aging with CP, and also the importance of physical uh, activity uh, and long-term outcomes. And then there were a number of other uh, uh, questions that did not fall into exactly into those buckets. Um, so in addition to that, within the 392, part of the way we got to 20 that we brought to the workshop was we looked at questions that were really essentially non-research questions. A number were advocacy-oriented. It's like uh, getting insurance coverage, getting in front of the federal government to get them to fund more research. Uh, a broad array of, of questions that fit under those, and we, we took those out. There were a number of things that were about developing best practice guidelines, which CPRN thinks is very important, but were not truly aligned with the, uh, with the objectives that we had set out with PCORI, and so we were trying to stick to the, the, the details of what we were um, uh, of what we had agreed to. Uh, and then there were a number of things that were really um, knowledge translation about getting what is known, what, is, what are the best practices that are known out as opposed to developing the best practices. Um, so that is, that is how we got to the 20 and then narrowed to the 16. Um, so some of the common observations or the sort of the key takeaways were really important because these were not necessarily research ideas per se, uh, but we felt they were pretty fundamental to what needed to be done. And these were expressed by multiple people at the workshop. So I have already referenced this point of the idea of keeping the momentum and keeping the sense of community uh, partnership moving forward. Um, so the idea of how we bring people together for uh, future discussions such as this um, is key. And some of what I'm going to announce at the end is also a, it was really aimed at um, addressing that, that desire. A second thing was the importance of longitudinal studies. The nature of funding of studies is they typically are funded over five, maybe seven years, and everybody was just so, uh, felt so strongly that being able to 
understand the impact of things that are done in early childhood at many stages of life is absolutely uh, critical. Um, and then uh, a third uh, thing that was resounding was the importance of the adult perspective, especially looking at all of that intervention that happens in childhood. But there was this sense that was communicated of sort of a cascading loss of function among a number of the adults in the room, and that was very eye-opening to some of the uh, parents of younger children in the room, and that was a really important uh, perspective. And then the last thing uh, I, I would say is that we really got a sense that of all the outcome measures that are so important to the way you conduct research, that participation was an absolutely critical outcome measure uh, to um, include in, in all research and have more outcome measures that were focused on participation. We did have limitations. Um, we were missing an adolescent voice. While we did have some parents of adolescents, we didn't actually have the adolescents or the teens contributing. And that's uh, one of the things that we're, we're going to work towards uh, addressing in the coming year. Um, CoDigital, the tool that we use to run the online surveys, tended to f favor more broad topics. They were a little bit motherhood and apple pie in the sense that they would um, address the needs of everyone. And they ended up being kind of directional research ideas, but not getting down to research questions. Um, there was a bit of selection bias, i.e., the people that, uh, that um, are set up to be online, that tend to watch things online, that tends to be a group that looks more alike than not alike, and so that does uh, create some bias in the results of the agenda. Um, and then, as I said, there, were, there was definitely some degree of influence by uh, the relative participation of different groups. We had, as an example, uh, a therapist who has a large following had, uh, had broadcast the existence of Research CP, and so we had more input from therapists than any other clinical function, and then probably followed next by physical medicine uh, and rehabilitation doctors. But in fact, that, that also corresponds to who spends the most time with, uh, with people in the community as a, as a function of their care needs. Um, and so overall, the important thing was that greater than 60% than of the um, agenda was set by the, by the community itself. Okay, so that is the summary. What I think, I'm, I'm going to go into progress and next steps, but since I went through that quickly, I'm going to take a moment and get off of mute so that if anybody has questions, they don't have to hold them uh, too long, and I'm not sure that I've been able to um, check. And uh, so... So I think if you do star six, you can unmute. And so I'm going to give a moment to see if anyone has any questions. And I'm giving a count just because I know that whenever I'm in a meeting and someone needs to unmute. Um, hi, Paul. Hey, okay. question. Hi, Paul. This is Poonam Pandey. Hi, Poonam. How are you? Good, thanks. Um, so I saw your uh, one of your slides. You said that uh, you were lacking the adolescent voice. Um, yes. So, um, what do you think? Like, do you think adolescents would be interested in participating? Because I know my son was not. Uh, he had he wanted to pursue his interests rather than focus on his condition at that age. Um, it's. It is a very good question, and uh, I will I'll give you a little preview of what um, I'm trying to get a group of teens that are interested in um, conveying their experiences and, and looking at the agenda and saying, what do they think is missing? And so right now, all I'm focused on is getting a group of teens online um, to be able to communicate, and it is definitely slow going. It's not Snapchat. Um, so it's hard to get them uh, it's hard to get them to engage. So 
I may not. I think that what you would find is some are interested and many are not. So it's a fair question. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? I see someone looking like they're going to ask, but maybe not. Okay, I'm going to go back to lecture mode and then talk about what we've done since we uh, finished the, the workshop and published the paper. Okay, so on to uh, progress and next steps. So um, clearly getting the results of the initiative published was a, was a big step. Um, and we, we got uh, the paper completed and went through a, a CPRN review in the fall of 2017 uh, and then got it submitted to Developmental Medicine and Child Neurology in January. It got accepted but with revisions and it's a fairly um, arduous process to get through the comments of referees as they're referred to um, and address their needs and we went through two rounds of that before we were published online in uh, 2018, August of 2018. The great part was uh, the American Academy for Cerebral Palsy and Developmental Medicine supported that being public. So since it was published, uh, it's always been free access for the paper, which was a, a really important piece. And then it was uh, published in print in December 2018. Uh, and then they've invited me to do a podcast uh, in 2019. I have not put that together yet, but I intend to do that to just uh, keep awareness of the research agenda uh, uh, front and center. Um, and then we've done a number of presentations about uh, research CP. Uh, we had finished um, writing the paper in the, in the fall, and I was able to brief uh, several groups, several director level uh, people at NIH about the findings from research CP. Um, we had a CPRN investigators meeting in uh, uh, in Houston in June, and we have a, of 2018, and we have one coming in May of 2019. And research CP is very central to those meetings in terms of driving stimulation of research uh, to fill in gaps in the agenda. Uh, we did a seminar at the the annual meeting for the uh, American Academy um, or AACPDM as it's called. Uh, in Cincinnati in 2018. And then it was also covered as part of a webinar that we did in January 2019 about how to partner with CPRN to conduct multi-center research. So we've done a lot of uh, presenting of it. Um, and we now, to propose research, if you're an investigator within CPRN, when you do your concept to be able to present the concept to the investigator committee to move it along as research, um, you need to actually cite which one of the research ideas in, in research CP uh, it refers to to be, to be able to present it as a concept. So it's fairly central to our opportunity map for CPRN. Um, and so we've done a lot to stimulate. And so we had the CPRN registry, which uh, is going to do a lot for providing a basis for comparative effectiveness of interventions. Um, but we are about to do a concept review of selective dorsal rhizotomy versus serial Botox uh, in um, the population that has uh, spastic diplegia or diplegic CP. And so that's a, a new study um, that's been worked on for uh, quite a bit of time, and we've done some preliminary uh, research to, to support that. Um, and then we have an analog to that, which is looking at spasticity treatments for the non-ambulatory population. Um, so looking at selective dorsal rhizotomy, which is starting to be used, Botox and baclofen pumps and oral baclofen. Uh, so that's actually from uh, being put together by uh, Dr. Shruti Thomas, who was actually at the research CP and is our first mentored young investigator. So that's a very exciting whole area of study she wants to devote uh, her early career to as a uh, attending 
um, pediatric physical medicine and rehabilitation doc. Uh, we have uh, a uh, study that we're going to do a review of a concept for in the next month on therapy dosing after single event multi-level surgery. So that's an involved orthopedic surgery. And um, Dr. Amy Bales from Cincinnati has done some great work um, to be able to capture data and uh, look at comparatively what makes for the best results. Uh, so we uh, have that concept being reviewed. And then we've got a group that's been working on surgical disparities to see whether or not uh, elements of uh, socioeconomic status um, and uh, um, social determinants of health have impact on outcomes for surgery. Um, so a lot of great new work that's that's been started since we finished the workshop in uh, in 2017 and published the paper. Um, and then I forgot to change the title here of the University of Michigan uh, research. But uh, another big area that came out is uh, Dr. Ed Hurwitz and some of his colleagues at the University of Michigan have been looking at uh, data collection that gets done uh, for looking at um, a variety of measures that are uh, great more predictive indicators of physical activity and chronic disease risk. And this was very tied into some of these health issues and concerns uh, about adulthood in cerebral palsy. Um, so that's, that's also new. Um, and then uh, along some of the other areas of interest that some of the other bucket areas of research CP, um, in terms of looking at aging from a longitudinal uh, perspective, once again, the CPR and registry was already defined and will capture very meaningful information, but we are going to be officially launching our uh, adult, um, adult study of social and emotional function um, and adult pain uh, that has been led by uh, Dr. Mary Gennati and Dr. Uh, Debbie Thorpe and the whole adult uh, study group. Um, so we're very excited to be getting to the point to launch that uh, officially uh, tonight, actually. I will talk about that in a little bit. Um, and then looking at longitudinal outcomes in general, uh, we have some pediatric measures. Uh, we have um, three um, pediatric measures, one called CP Pro, uh, another called CP Child, which is intended for um, the non-ambulatory population, and then the Gate Outcomes Assessment List, or GOAL, which is intended to uh, measure um, goals for people receiving uh, orthopedic interventions for gait. Um, and then on the um, pain and fatigue was another uh, area, and again, uh, uh, Dr. Gennady's study is going to be key to getting some answers in, in that area. And then clearly we have some gaps in the area of, of trials in, in this area, but that will take some time generating this other preliminary data before uh, we are ready and able to do that. We also had two new studies funded uh, that were that were touched on and Im important topics within research CP. There's a lot of discussion about um, comorbidities in CP, and there's a very large overlap um, of uh, people that have both CP and epilepsy. And uh, Dr. Adam Ostendorf from Nationwide Children's Hospital uh, received $200,000 in funding from the Pediatric Epilepsy Research Foundation. Uh, for those of you that were uh, at the Research CP workshop, uh, Dr. Deborah Hertz, who was there, is on the board of this organization and really encouraged us to apply uh, for this grant. And Dr. Dr. Ostendorf is a uh, pediatric neurologist that's done, is doing some great work to enable the study of, of epilepsy and CP together. Um, so it's really an infrastructure grant that allows us to gather the data that we need to describe, um, describe the population, uh, and then also to do uh, what's called decision support. So really making sure that as um, 
under certain uh, conditions of, of epilepsy within the CP population, the appropriate medications are being recommended uh, and best practices are being implemented. So that's a very exciting two-year study uh, that is uh, new and fills a really, really gets a, a new set of five uh, um, neurologists studying the area of epilepsy and CP um, as a, a great future area of investment for the network. And then the other is uh, Dr. Michael Kruer has been funded by NIH uh, to look at uh, genetic causes of cerebral palsy. And initially, he's he's looking at people that have what's called cryptogenic CP, or they have CP of an unknown uh, cause. But the fundamental infrastructure of what he's building will allow us to do what is called precision medicine or personalized medicine, which is eventually start to look at uh, the genetic factors that improve or can gauge responsiveness to various treatments and so that you can begin to personalize what treatment plans make sense based on someone's uh, genetic code. Um, so that's uh, very exciting. And the way that works is that uh, people will be referred to uh, Dr. Kruer at Phoenix Children's from the registry, so from any of our registry sites, and then they actually use a, a spit kit. They get sent a spit kit, and uh, uh, he will be able to collect um, their DNA of both the parents and the, the child, uh, and then they'll sequence the DNA, and CPRM will provide the analysis of the uh, patient characteristics, also referred to as the phenotypic characteristics, in the registry, and this is enabling um, great new study. And this is a $2.5 million grant from NIH over five years. So this is a tremendous win for understanding more about causes of cerebral palsy. We've also, um, we are just launching in the next, uh, one this week and one next week, two new uh, study groups uh, within, uh, that are really driven by Research CP. Um, so we've been considering a Research CP 2.0, as we called it, where we would look at what we did with Research CP and figure out uh, what would we do differently, and in particular, how could we look at the places where we didn't get enough um, feedback, or because, as I said in the limitations, co-digital tended to favor things that were uh, very general, and so. Um, fewer people have a diagnosis of dystonia, uh, but it's, uh, it's a real confounder in how to treat CP. And so we're going to do a research CP-like process, i.e. some webinars and then co-digital, probably not do a face-to-face -face, uh, workshop, but maybe some other uh, online technique to set what are the most important questions to ask in uh, dystonia in under the umbrella of CP. Um, this is, we've got a great group of people that are interested in this, um, and we will publicize broadly when we start to do the sort of public-facing uh, education and uh, survey mechanism. So we're very excited to launch that group, and we have uh, Jonathan Mink joining us, who's currently the, a neurologist who is the um, president of the Child Neurology Society. Uh, and is just a very influential person in this domain, uh, joining our effort to uh, figure out the most important questions there. So we really want that to be a patient-centric uh, solution. Uh, Michael, Dr. Michael Kruger is going to be involved in that as, as well. Um, and then the second is transition. And transition, so meaning healthcare transition from the pediatric institutions to adult institutions, um, this was a very interesting thing that was in the top 20 that came uh, to the meeting. And as the group, that actual first uh, photograph that I showed was the group that was discussing that. And what they decided, and rightly so, is that transition is really a quality improvement process. And we had decided not to bring QI processes to the meeting. Um, but it's a super important topic. So I'm really excited that CPRN is going to take on a quality improvement process to look at transition. And so at what point do we start educating uh, kids in the pediatric population about 
taking responsibility for their healthcare needs, uh, interacting with uh, the clinicians, and then eventually being ready to transfer into the adult system, which is so incredibly different. There's a bunch of capacity building issues uh, as well as um, issues for um, a, a patient to understand how different the adult care system is from the pediatric system and be ready for it. So I'm very excited that we'll be taking those uh, two new areas on. And uh, like I said, quite literally, starting transition tomorrow and starting the dystonia uh, working group uh, the following week. So um, big, big pieces of outcome driven entirely by uh, research CP. So with all of this, I just figured I would share uh, the study pipeline for CPRN. So I very often talk about how uh, in addition to building this infrastructure to be able to conduct all these studies, that my goal is to fill the front of that funnel with as many ideas as possible. And so what you see is that ideas start out as sort of study groups in the wide part of the funnel, and then what they're trying to do is get to that first line, which is to do a concept review with the investigator committee. Um, and then once they cross that hurdle and they get a thumb, thumbs up from 70% of the investigator committee, they move on to um, some subsequent reviews to try to get ready for an application to a funder. Uh, and then once they're funded, they you know, uh, move on to get institutional review board or ethics approval to make sure the research is conducted ethically. And then we start to get into study implementation. And so you can see we've got a number of these ideas that are, oh, that's apparently on a timer. Um, number of these ideas that are really in the very early phases, um, a number that are right up against the line to do a concept review and some that are moving along, and then a number of pieces that are uh, in either implementation or execution um, at this stage and uh, moving into that next area. And some will stay in execution for a protracted period of time because they are longitudinal in nature. We're going to just keep them running for years and years and generate findings uh, you know, each year uh, from what we're learning. Uh, and then a number have already started to move into uh, the manuscript phase where we have a number, um, we've got two manuscripts that we're just finalizing, uh, changing a little direction on one, but trying to find a journal to, uh, to publish them. And that's part of, you know, implementing change of, from the evidence base that, that we developed that's so critical to uh, changing outcomes in, in cerebral palsy. Uh, so uh, one other data point, so the, the, um, the clinical research, uh, the clinical registry is really uh, being implemented right now. It's in various phases at 24 sites across North America. So those green dots are where we're enrolling patients currently. Uh, the yellow pins are imminent. Um, that means they've got their EPIC forms, which is the uh, electronic medical record forms, up and running, but they haven't gotten them quite deployed yet and entering patient data. Uh, and then the red ones are sites that have joined the network, but they're still working through a number of the uh, administrative issues uh, to get the registry up and running. And then the blue pins represent candidate sites, sites that have raised their hand and have said they want to join the network, and they're starting to, they basically have to do the first step, which is they have to get IRB approval for the registry, and then they are in the network. So a lot of activity, and I've probably um, got a, a few more uh, that would be blue pins that are not on the map yet that are uh, looking to join and they just need to get a little more information. So I think it's going to be an exciting year with sites like the Weinberg Center coming on board uh, shortly in New York uh, City and uh, I have uh, the Shirley Ryan Ability Lab used to be um, uh, RIC, the Re Rehabilitation Institute of Chicago. Uh, very interested but I don't have a pin for them yet they're just getting some, gathering some data. So lots of traction for CPRN and the registry that will make implementing all of these things and getting their results rolled out uh, to places where people are treated for CP uh, happening with an within evidence base. 
Okay. I'm going to stop there. I'm going to, um, before I talk about opportunities for engagement, it's another big bit of information and let people uh, ask questions. So Again, so if anybody has a question, star six will allow you to unmute. I'll give a little pause and wait to see if anybody has anything they want to ask. Hi, Paul. Do you understand me? I do. Hi, Melissa. Um, I'm just wondering, uh, for the CPRN registry, it's still only in English, isn't it? That is true. It is only in English at this stage. Okay. Uh, okay, thank you. Okay. Um, that was an interest in French, in case anyone was wondering. Um, okay, any other questions? Yes. Hi, go ahead. Um, I was wondering how um, the research on the SDR and um, Botox for diplegics, uh -huh. considering mm -hmm. one is neurosurgery and the other one is a neurotoxin, how was that, um, I guess, decided or correlated um, I, I guess I see them very differently, um, or very, you know, very, very different um, procedures. So I'm just wondering how that was um, uh, put together as as being a comparison and and um, uh, yeah, uh, as comparing those um, well treatments. So. So what we did was we went out and we interviewed 45 physicians at 15 centers across uh, across North America that do spasticity management, and we looked at their surgical spasticity program. And invariably, what we found from the sort of mostly the physical medicine docs is that they typically did Botox, you know, one or more times, and then depending on some of the patient characteristics recommended that those uh, those kids get evaluated for um, you know, permanent spasticity removal through SDR. Um, and so, and it's a, it's a very interesting program because it's not offered everywhere. And so some sites that don't have SDR refer out for it, some do not. And consequently, there's a pretty wide um, variety of ways in which uh, diplegics are treated for spasticity management between these two modalities. And so what we're really hoping to answer is um, questions about the best in indications uh, and um, for those indications where they overlap, what, what results in a better outcome. And then also within the SDR arm, what is the right age to do SDR because there's a fair amount of variability there. Um, so um, about so that that's kind of the driver. It's the the three big modalities are physical therapy alone, physical therapy and uh, Botox, potentially repeat Botox, and then selective dorsal rhizotomy. Okay, thank you for the clarification. Yeah, no worries. Any other questions? Hi, Paul. This is Poonam again. Um, Hi, Poonam. Uh, so uh, along the same lines with SDR versus Botox, I saw on that slide you had two um, uh, circles with SDR Botox. One is close to manuscript publication and the other one is uh, still getting to the concept. So what is the difference between those two? I, I saw that there was something else written on the other one that was close to the manuscript. Yeah, that's a great question. Very good observation. So um, there is a group of us working on defining, that have been working on defining uh, the study as a observational trial. And um, in late 2017, we said, hmm, there seems to be a fair amount of practice variation here. And so the group designed a set of questions to ask about Botox treatments 
uh, and practice and selective dorsal rhizotomy um, indications and practice. And then uh, I set out and so I interviewed these 45 physicians and asked those questions. It was an hour long interview with each physician. Um, so, you know, nearly 45 hours of interviewing. And we've completed that and we're now, and we've uh, done some of the qualitative analysis. So that's a qualitative study of practice variation for spasticity management in uh, diplegic CP. And uh, we are doing the analysis and starting, going to start to write that up. We've been accepted also as a abstract to be presented as a, as a scientific poster at the 2019 uh, meeting for AACPDM. Um, so that's the piece that you saw that was to the right and further down. It's the practice variation qualitative study. The thing that was getting reviewed for a concept uh, that's getting reviewed next week, if we stay on track, is a, an observational trial. So what we will do is capture all the data for kids that come through the network uh, and get either serial Botox treatments or um, get selective dorsal rhizotomy and capture an outcome, uh, a series of outcome measures um, and uh, conduct the study observationally, i.e., we're not randomizing between patients and an intervention, but we're going to observe and characterize the, the patient similarities and differences uh, and measure them uh, on outcome. So one's an observational study, the other is a, um, a, an observational clinical study, and the other is a practice variation qualitative study. Okay, so um, in the observational study uh, that's getting to the concept review, uh, is there any age restriction on, I know SDR has, like, is age dependent, I think, uh, but in terms of Botox, I, is there any age restriction in that? Um, yes, we're, we're probably going to have, we we have to narrow this a bit, but it's, you know, Botox treatments for spasticity typically don't start any earlier than two. We may not start looking until three or four. We kind of want to get kids in the four to six age ranges, um, but my guess is we, we've got a little more work to do um, af probably after we do the concept, but it's probably an inclusion criteria of somewhere between two and six, maybe two and eight, might be four and eight. Um, a little detailed, but it's going to be young. Okay. Um, okay. So I think I, I think we can talk a little bit more maybe offline. Sure. Uh, about that. Okay, that's fine. Feel Thanks. feel free to email me on that. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Any other questions? Okay. Uh, I am going to put you all back on mute. Okay, so now I'd like to talk about opportunities for you to be able to stay engaged. And I've got this broken up. This call is about split. It's a little more heavily aimed uh, in terms of attendees by members of the community. Um, and I'm going to, this first slide is aimed at that. Then I'm going to have a set of screenshots that are really aimed at, at everyone. Uh, and then I'm going to talk about opportunities for the uh, clinician researchers or clinicians alone to stay engaged. Um, so the other big initiative that we are uh, kicking off um, as of tonight is we're finally opening mycerebralpalsy.org. People that were at the workshop got a quick demonstration of this, but this is a web portal that's owned and operated by CPRN, and it really provides access to what is called the CPRN Community Registry. So the CPRN Community Registry is unlike the clinical registry, which is taking data from the medical record, these are surveys that, that you as a member of the community take, either about you um, if you have cerebral palsy or about your loved one that has cerebral palsy. Um, and so there are a, a wide variety of surveys already that are in the community registry, um, and that is where Dr. Uh, Dr. Janatis and Dr. Thorpe's uh, pain and um, uh, global health surveys are. It's called personal well-being in, in the uh, community registry. So it's really an opportunity for you to start to contribute data directly 
to the body of data that can drive research and get more answers. Um, so my cerebral palsy, and I'm going to give you some screenshots to give you a sense of this. My cerebral palsy is where you can go and sign up and then participate from my cerebral palsy in the community registry um, through a secure connection to servers at the University of Utah. Um, you can optionally be uh, contacted for clinical studies for which uh, you would be an appropriate fit for, totally optional as to whether or not you participate in, in any of those. And then in addition to the whole research side of it, there's a discussion forum that's really intended for us to be able to gather some of these missing voices um, and gather in a preserved kind of way thoughts about research priorities and discuss particular research studies or research areas, research gaps. Um, so we're, we've created it as an enduring way to keep the community engaged and, and potentially find opportunities to engage in research with uh, clinicians. As, was, as we talked about at the workshop, the concept of keeping the partnership going where there are members of the community that are working side by side with um, clinician researchers to design studies, to think about the consent, to uh, promote the study, to uh, analyze the results, to disseminate the results. There's tremendous benefit in working together in doing that, and this is a, another way in which you can potentially get connected um, there. And then in the long run, I, we do this a little bit now, but I will say it's quite narrow, is we're, it's a way for you to stay informed about new research. Right now, that's going to be informed about new research that CPRN is doing um, in a sort of a consumer-focused voice. Um, but um, in the long run, we hope to be able to sort of cull the field of research and provide some commentary on new research that's, that's either being done or that's been concluded and what its meaning is. Um, so there are some efforts that get done on that, but they tend to be um, – they tend to be flat. There, there's no differentiation between what's, what's got high quality data, what does not, uh, how do you interpret these results, and we're, we're really looking to get away that that is uh, um, more, there's more editorial function that's happening to make sure we're really just uh, putting out the information that's um, most impactful and, uh, and is high quality, high impact research. Um, so that's mycerebralpalsy.org. That is open now. You can go and join. I'm going to show you some screenshots. Um, and then there is also the ability to participate in Research CP 2.0, which for now is going to be this dystonia effort, uh, which if you're on our mailing list, you'll hear about as we get going. And if, you've, um, and there, if it's meaningful to you, you're welcome to participate in that. So um, I'm actually going to try just going over to one of my – to going over to my browser uh, to show you this. But this is the MyCP homepage where you can go and you see that big green join button right there is what you can click on or this little light blue join button. Uh, and then that will take you through um, – I'm going to see if I can uh, just show you this from – my browser, actually. So give me a moment. So if you click on join, you end up uh, with an explanation of what you're joining, but you can enter your username, your email, password. You have a display name where you are – you can – it generates an ID for you. If you want to be totally anonymous, you use this. If you want to be – um, have your name out there or your favorite nickname, you can have that. And that's what appears in discussions. Um, it's not used any, anywhere else. And then you sign up and you can uh, say what, you know, under what um, reason you're coming to join my CP. So for clinicians and research scientists and advocates, it's an opportunity to participate in the discussions. For people with CP or caregivers of people with CP, it's an opportunity to participate in the research. We may have research of the clinical community to conduct down the road, but it's not the current plan. So when you click on being a person with CP, you get to some demographics. You will see things like full name, and people go, whoa, why do you need my name? And so you actually, when, as soon as you enter your, your name here, it, it goes away. We use it to generate a code 
that gets combined with your birth date and your gender to generate a unique ID that can't be reverse engineered to your name. Um, it's just so that we can connect uh, these studies with the CPRN registry and get more value out of the data that you contribute. Um, but anyway, so you, you fill in name, how you want to be referred to, birth date, um, you, you know, fill in gender, um, you fill in race, ethnicity, and then we have a few CP questions that we ask. And this is all about targeting surveys to you. Some of the age questions are, are about targeting surveys as well. But you, you describe the distribution of your cerebral palsy, the type of cerebral palsy that you um, have, the movement disorder, if you, if you know what it is, uh, and then your gross motor function classification uh, scale number. Um, and we give different diagrams based on, on your age as to whether or not you fit the sort of child diagram or the adults. Um, and then when you, you move on from there and you get to surveys, and the first thing you're confronted with is a consent form. So if you go to the consent, um, you're, you're given a, you know, a one-page consent that explains what you would be consenting to. Um, at the point that you do that consent, you're then, um, you then get presented with consent with other surveys that make sense based on your age, your GMFCS level, um, and then depending on what surveys we have in the system, and right now we have about 10, you might get some number of those. There's a, a, a batch of medical history where you can give some information more about your, um, your, your medical um, treatments and whatnot, your personal well-being, which is the beginning of the adult survey, uh, and then the functional abilities is a follow-on to that about your um, upper extremity and lower extremity capabilities. Uh, and your use of uh, and your use of devices. So this is where the the surveys appear. Um, every survey gets uh, when you're you're completed, it becomes a PDF, so you can download it. Um, so you can have that as a thing to bring to a, a doctor's office if that makes sense, um, or if you just want to have a record of what you've done. Um, and then when you actually take a survey. Um, it actually is, this is actually running at the University of Utah, and it presents you with a series of, of questions. You know, see this example about your employment status. This is an adult survey um, if you're looking at your employment. Um, so um, that's how you, you work through these, and then when you're done, you hit submit, and that finishes the survey. Or here's just an example of the, the medical history to give you an idea. Um, what, what clinics you get seen? Have you seen a dentist? Height, weight, um, body mass index, vision, as an example. Um, so there's a series of data points that we collect. These are intended to be some are like um, three minutes or less. There are a few of the surveys, like the whole pain bundle, probably takes about 20 minutes. Um, so there are some that are a little bit longer. Uh, you can, depending on the survey, you'll you can re-enter it if you can't finish it all at once. Um, so that's the survey side of it. You also have, um, as I uh, as I pointed out when I was on my uh, this screen, you have a forum as well, um, and the forum is a place where discussions can happen. And so um, we post blog posts here that can then be discussed, and you can actually start up a threaded discussion about anything, but it's really intended to be a discussion about research. We do have a teen forum that we've been building here. We've got about uh, five uh, teens. We're trying to recruit teens to create a place for them to have a private discussion, uh, and then we're going to see if we can engage them in a, in a discussion about uh, what they think is important from a research perspective which may or may not be successful. Um, we shall see. Um, and just to show you, and then you can see as an example of, well, maybe I don't have users here. I'll bring it up uh, here. So if you look at uh, users as an example, you can see some people's actual name is here. 
and in some cases there are IDs here. And so you have your choice as to whether or not you want to be out there with your name, have a nickname, um, or um, or have a totally obscured uh, ID there. So to wrap it up, I want to come back and just talk about the opportunities for um, the researchers to stay engaged. Um, so you too, as I said, can join my cerebral palsy and uh, participate in the conversations uh, and allow you to connect with CPRN um, initiatives. And there are people there that can potentially be patient partners for collaborating on patient-centered research. You can also propose a study to CPRN. Uh, I will be posting our June, or I'm sorry, our January 19th uh, or 17th webinar that we did about how you can propose a study to CPRN and uh, use the network to conduct multi-center research. Or you can actually join CPRN and become a, a registry site. Um, and then lastly, we will uh, broadcast broadly the opportunity to participate in Research CP 2.0 for the dystonia discussion. So we're at an hour, and with that, I'm going to open it up to uh, questions. Again, you can do star six to uh, unmute, or if you're using just your computer, there should be a graphic of a, of a microphone. So I'll open up for questions, and then we'll wrap up. Hey, Paul, it's Karen. Hi, Karen. I noticed on the map that the majority of the sites are still children's hospitals. Has there been any uptick in clinicians being interested in focusing or either expanding to adults? There's been, there's been great uptick. So as I don't know if you heard me say, the Weinberg Center is joining, uh, which yeah, is I tremendous. Yeah, I about that one. And and Yale has joined, and that's in a, they, they have pediatric, but they're an adult center. Um, but, yeah, so those are, to me, two big upticks. Uh, the Shirley, Ability, Shirley Ryan Ability Lab is a, um, is a lifespan uh, center. So there are a number of, of centers. There's a center in Chicago, I'm sorry, not Chicago, in uh, Miami that's coming online that is lifespan as well. So... There's, um, there's a broad array of, of interest. Um, I think we have probably, um, I would say, about a third of our centers are lifespan. Okay. Because I went to Gillette, and they said they were just now starting because they've been following the kids that have aged out. Yep. So they're just now sure. looking into adults, and they said yep. they don't see many high-functioning ones. Yeah. Well, that could be just because Gillette's such a specialty place that that's, you know, that might be just a na the nature of their um, who is coming back to them. But, um, but yeah, it's, it's, we're definitely interested in more adult, um, adult centers. We, we, you know, there's no, there are no barriers to adult centers. So we're happy to have Yale join us. Um, so, Definitely want to see more of that over time. Okay. Thanks. Um, any other questions? Okay. Well, I want to thank you all very much for joining us this evening. Um, I hope this uh, made you feel motivated by what's going on with Research CP. And um, we'll keep you informed. Go sign up for My Cerebral Palsy. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.